So uh, welcome um, to our college, all college meeting, uh, December 9th, 2022. I can't believe it. We're in the midst of our year end and it's been um, really busy and exciting. And uh, next week is one of the best weeks as I get to attend a lot of ceremonies, events, and um, of course our, our um, graduation event on Saturday, December 17th. And uh, our college is at 9 a.m. Um, in the morning. So um, it, I'm really thrilled to um, be part of this um, very exciting week. And thank you for taking your, your time, your valuable time to meet this morning. Um, the outline for today, if I can advance, here we go, are just some overall WMU updates, not too many, um, but more importantly, what's going on with our college. And um, um, I have the different areas that we're going to discuss today, as well as the individuals in charge. And we have a great diverse group of Hello. people. Hello. Who is that? Good morning. Good night. Um, we have a, a number of topics and um, I think some important information uh, that will set sort of the tone for where we are yeah, now. That way I'm not bothering anyone if they come in to study or. I expect it to be a lot of things. Yeah, the, the thesis, yeah. I have it would be great minutes. if everybody would mute. Shalhan, I think you need to, um, to, to mute. Fun. Ron, you can mute her if you really? her over her right hand upper corner. Okay. 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 A little bit lower. I mean, I can stay here if you think no one's going to be in here. Yeah, it's completely up to you. I do think it's so. Okay. Good. All right. Thank you, Jasmine. All right. So why don't we go through and um, just begin? And um, again, if you have questions along the way, maybe put them in the chat, and and we'll try to get those toward the end. So a couple of updates, if you don't know already, that in academic affairs, we will be um, welcoming our new provost, uh, Julian Vasquez Heilig, or Heilig, um, and he will be joining us January 4th, um, so very soon, in about three weeks, and we're excited for him to join our team. He brings a lot of um, expertise, passion, and direction when it comes to what we can do for our university. Um, and um, in how we move forward uh, together um, in, in a team effort. Um, and we're really thrilled to, to welcome him for next week. It was a, it was a, um, a quick, very efficient and um, energized search. And um, we're really thrilled to have uh, Dr. Vasquez Heilig here uh, next month. Um, the vision that we're, being, we're working on right now um, and I think it's near final. If this isn't, I know it's maybe going to press in the next few days um, and will be, will be then released, but this is pretty close. Um, that um, WMU empowers every person to grow, thrive, and belong. We contribute to making the world a better place through creativity, research, innovation, and compassion. The mission is we are an access-oriented institution that provides an impactful and inclusive education that integrates discovery and fosters holistic growth and well-being so that all may learn. Uh, five values, which I think are in amazing areas that we can cultivate are learner-focused, equity-centered, community-engaged, discovery-driven, and sustainability-guided. And um, that's an interesting one where I think there's an oppor uh, opportunity for our university to make sure that we can sustain into the future. Um, I did want to um, highlight a couple of things regarding the uh, strategic resource management or SRM. Uh, fiscal 23 continues to be a transition learning year. There's tweaks to the, the overall model is pretty well set, but as I'll talk about in a second, there's also a, a new component being added in the strategic allocation plan or the subvention plan. But the full implementation of the SRM was impacted a little bit by the pandemic, right? I think we wanted, we did model it year over year about two years ago to be implemented. And we 
believe that now all of the formulaic aspects of the SRM are set. Um, and now we're working on some other aspects, again, related primarily to the subvention plan, but I'll get into that in a sec. As a college, we are well positioned um, financially for this year. We are generating actually 4.12 million more revenue than we expend. And that's um, a, 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 an amazing place to be. And in fact, I'm gonna advance the slide to show you and then I'll go back to the last bullet. So here's where the college is vis-a-vis -vis the other colleges. Um, as you might imagine, um, business is um, outperforming all when it comes to revenue and expenses. They're able to do that because of you know, larger classes with um, um, uh, a cert, uh, an instructor or professor. Um, um, and um, CHD is next at 4.94, right around 5 million above in revenues over expenses. We're next at 4.12. And then as you might imagine, fine arts, um, for a lot of reasons, most of all is that their instruction is, a lot of it is one-on-one. -on -one. They have a lot of space. In fact, with their space alone, I think it's somewhere upwards of six to seven million in space costs alone because of their large areas and square foot footage with their theaters. It really puts them at a disadvantage in that sense. College of Arts and Sciences at 5.22. We heavily rely on the College of Arts and Sciences for the first year or two of our, our students' education. Uh, College of, Ed of Engineering and Applied Sciences is about three and a half or so million in the red. And then um, the College of Aviation is tied to the line at about 1.2 million. So um, going back, um, to the last bullet here, um, there we're working. In fact, um, we've we've just fine-tuned a strategic alloc allocation plan, and that is basically where some of the dollars for those groups, those colleges that are, are in the positive, will get some of that funding back over time, and the colleges that are um, uh, are revenue in the red. Um, or um, revenue expenses in the red, that they're not meeting their expenses with the revenue, will be giving some of that funding back. So they have to make cuts, and in some cases, dramatic cuts over the next few years. I do have to say that it will never be that the all of our colleges will be at zero. Not all of our colleges will be able to bring in the revenue to meet their expenses, but that's why we're a synergistic um, interdisciplinary university that values the education that we provide across the spectrum. And um, I do know that in healthcare, uh, SRM um, or really RCM, which is strict revenue centered management, which is you have to meet your, your, um, your revenues have to meet your expenses or you have to cut programs. That hasn't worked. In fact, um, uh, just think of like, if you can imagine surgery versus family medicine, who do you think um, is the unit that would bring in much more revenue than, than the other unit, um, which is of course the surgery. So it's never worked in medicine. Sometimes it, it hasn't worked in at universities as well. And some universities have actually given up on an, a strict RCM model. With SRM, we're, we're allowing for strategy. We're allowing for what do we want to be as a university and then to help fund those aspects of the university that, that are important to us. And we have a strong fi um, fine arts program uh, and set of programs. So in this first year of the subvention model, um, the anticipated amount that we will be getting, in fact, we just got it yesterday, is two, about $286,000, I believe, we received. It's in one-time dollars this year. Now, hopefully, if we hold our own in our enrollments relative to the campus, we'll be able to have that $286,000 put into our budget, our base budget for next year. So in the, in, in the middle of the year, we'll be getting some subvention dollars back 
as one time, but then if we continue to do well and, and meet our projections into the future and better than the rest or at minimum at the same uh, in, as the rest of the university, we will be getting some of that, those dollars back in base budget. It's based on three different pools. One is the pure money. Another is, did we go up or down relative to the previous year? And then some quality indicators that are identified within our college that we can look at relative to previous years to see if we are on track. That last pool and quality indicators, we are not there yet. It's really complex. It's full of, um, you know, differential indicators depending on the program. So we're still working that through. So we're in the first year of this subvention model and the our college will be receiving about $280,000 back. All right, so um, now we have a number of uh, updates for um, the college and I'm gonna be calling on several individuals to help in having this discussion moving forward. And, and I believe the first up is um, our associate dean, our interim associate dean, Dr. Chase. Carla? But do you want me to talk about this real quick? Yes, I, I understand that that might be your slide. Okay, all right. Minutes, so, so. so this is um, sort of what we've come up um, regarding our college marketing wise. Again, we have to remember this is marketing. Uh, these are the sort of higher level areas of health and human services that we have within our college. We have 12 different kind of disciplines, as you see within here. And it's been really um, helpful for me. In fact, I just used this yesterday in meeting with um, all of the deans and the provost at Grand Rapids Community College. When we're talking about pathways for our students that are, in this case, coming as transfer students, from GRCC, could be KVCC and others, on what are those careers that will capture the imagination of students that are either from high school or coming from community colleges. And it's been very helpful. You've seen this before, but this is sort of the final version. And we're gonna have these at like our admitted student events for undergraduate events and so on. Now here is a slide and I put draft on it. It's just my conceptualization of what, and Joel's, <laughs> of what we look like as a college. Where are our programs? Where are our, our support services? Where are our student services? Where things are kind of housed and how it interrelates with unified clinics and disability services. But these are the same sort of 12 sub-disciplines that we have in those three larger conceptual areas. In the middle, and very strategically so, we have our School of Interdisciplinary Health Programs, which we see as a major connector and building blocks um, uh, to get into some of our programs. There are some programs within SIP that are disciplinary programs and, and um, terminal programs in their own right as well, but then there are some that are certificate and some that can be pathways. And this is just our, my way, our way to conceptualize what we look like as a college. And this can be tweaked and we'll be talking about this in the future. Again, no structural changes, but uh, more following through with the conception, the marketing, what conceptually can, can we, how can we operate to operational in a way operationalize those pathways. I'm done. And then now we're on to Carla. If you could go ahead and advance to the next slide. Okay. Good morning, everyone. A quick update as to where we are on the strategic planning and revisiting uh, revisioning. This is the overall process that we're going through. These are the, uh, first of all, the guides for the process are some of the things that Dean Sisler talked about, the input of our college community, all you guys, all along the way, and internal and external factors that impact how we do what we do. We have the College Council and Student Leadership Council that are acting as advisory boards, steering committee, um, which started in November, 
a little bit more about that in a sec. And then the working groups, which is where a lot of the nuts and bolts and where the ideas will be generated for who we want to be in the future. So you'll see that the WMU um, values that we decided on as a, as a campus entity, a campus community, and there'll be a work group for each of those five values. So next slide. So here are the steering committee members. We have had two two hour meetings and they were packed full of ideas and a lot of brainstorming, including what's the difference between a mission and a vision statement, which every time we go through this process, that's part of the, the conversation. But it really helped us take a look at who we see ourselves as at the college and, and what we want to do better, where we want to strengthen what we're doing. So it's been a great conversation and I appreciate uh, this group. We have one more meeting this semester. They'll be continuing on as the working groups start. And that's perfect. No, that's fine, Ron, go ahead. Um, they'll be continuing on in, in a variety of roles as we move forward with this process in the spring. Now, this first part that was part of the steering committee's work was just to, to create a draft mission and this is a very draft vision statement. You all will have opportunities to provide feedback on this. We just needed to get some things out there and, and start to move some things forward. So the mission, what we do, our mission is to prepare all learners to thrive in health and human service careers that are high in purpose, high in satisfaction and unsurpassed in impact. So that's the mission draft. The very draft vision statement or who we want to be or what we want to do better or where we want to put our energy in the future is our vision is to be an institution that engages every person in a supportive, caring, inclusive environment that inspires compassion, advocacy, and integrity. So again, you'll have an opportunity to play with this over the next couple of months, but I just wanted to show that we have a draft that's that's moving along. So next. Uh, yeah, thank you. So next steps, we have the steering committee, one more meeting this semester. The goal of that meeting will be to start creating the templates and the guides and the timeline that will be provided to the working group. So they have some structure and some guidance on how to, on how to move forward. The steering committee members will also be working within the work group. Uh, we will have steering committee members within each of the working groups to help with communication. And then we're going to continue to work on the mission and vision and get um, get feedback from the broader CHHS community, not just within our college, but our, our community members as well that we work closely with. So working groups are forming now and work will start in January. So next slide. Real quick, um, yes. Carla, do you wanna say something about the student engagement aspect here? Yes, we have um, student leadership councils on our, is one of our advisory boards. We met with them, I guess, I don't know what week Tuesday. it was, or if it was last, I don't know. Recently, within the last- yeah, Tuesday, Carla, it was just Oh, Tuesday. Tuesday. <laughs> Recently, no, that, was, that was close. Um, and we are also facilitating getting a student representation or more within each of the working groups. So, and they'll be, as part of the larger community, they will also have opportunities at an individual basis to provide feedback. We think it's really important. So here's my ask. We have five working groups that are starting in January. Here are the five values. And the tricky bit is we don't want to, within these working groups, we don't want to just capture the things that we already feel we're doing. I mean, these are supposed to be action items that we can de dedicate energy to as we move forward. We have brainstorming pages that we've started now, um, starting at the steering, the steering group level. Um, and then we're going to be adding our advisory boards to kind of start throwing ideas on. I think one of the ones we had in our previous ones with sustainability was having um, non clamshell carry out, you know, within the cafe. It could be something as small as that, mm -hmm. or it could be how, as Dean Sisler mentioned, how we keep our college sustainable in the future. All the community engagement, we do a lot already. We don't need to capture everything we're doing. We need to capture how we enhance or improve what we're doing or other ideas. So this starts in January. My ask is please consider signing up for one of these working groups. We still have some spots open and we want a broad range of, of people within the college, a broad range of roles within people in the college. 
and and we want to make sure everybody's voice is heard but we want to do so in a way that's moving forward we have we have a lot to do and and i'm really excited about it and i'm i'm having a blast and the steering committee i mean i can't speak for all of them but it seems they seem to be having a little bit of fun if i can say that so anyway moving forward please consider either a student that you feel may be interested in one of these groups or if you feel particularly passionate at least when we open up the brainstorming pages please get your ideas out there so that we know i don't care how crazy it is i i keep joking about how i want a child care center up in the fourth floor grant room and a doggy daycare downstairs i don't think that's asking for a lot so <laughs> no idea is too crazy as we get started. So thanks everybody. And thank you to the groups that have participated and gotten us this far. Thank you so much, Carla. I really appreciate your leadership in moving us forward on this. It's vital and we're- And Jasmine. And Jasmine, yes. Absolutely, right there. <laughs> yes, thank you. Appreciate it. So um, next we are gonna get some um, year-end wrap-up updates on uh, the CHHS Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Dr. Betty Dennis is with us. And Betty, will you uh, take it from here? Absolutely. Um, good morning, everybody. We are so excited um, about all of the work that we've completed this semester or this year, and then what we're planning to do um, in the future. I don't want to um, go quick too quickly past this this slide. Um, just so you can see all of the um, hardworking folks who've, who've been um, instrumental in making this happen. And, um, and so I wanna make sure that we say a huge thank you to each and every single one of them um, um, because they've been, um, as I said, instrumental in, in pulling things together, having great ideas um, and moving us forward. Um, the next slide will show you um, some of the things that we've done this year. And we've broken ourselves up, as um, you probably already know, we've broken ourselves up in, into several subcommittees. And so we've had a lot of anti-bias training. And this training is, um, um, is training that you and your students can be involved in um, and, and um, we're even trying to get you information early enough on so that you can put it in your syllabus or um, um, add it as extra credit. But the anti-bias training, some of the things that we did this year, you, you'll see are on the screen um, where we had intersectionality. We've had um, um, trainings that deal with the LGBTQ com community, um, identity, power, and privilege we sponsored. Um, different events throughout this past year. You will see that with Harriet Washington and Billy Mills. Um, we had two Berean lecturers this um, this year who came and um, and shared um, valuable information. Dr. Deidre Cooper Owens and then Dr. Seth, Seth Schuster. We held a um, um, diversity, equity, and inclusion conference. And in addition to that because of the subcommittees that we've had with data and community outreach. Um, we have code of ethics, um, a student DEI committee, along with making sure that we plan um, our budget appropriately. You'll see that we've developed plans for um, um, the departments to hire a, a more diverse faculty. We um, apply for the insight to diversity Higher Education Health Professions Award. While we did not get that award, um, we it did show us some things that we need to work on. One of it, one of those things being that we've got to um, increase our diverse faculty if we're going to um, be considered for this particular award. You've probably seen on our website um, how we've changed the data that we've put forward and um, made sure that it's more transparent, more clarifying. And so that's out there. We relocated the office of the DEI office downstairs to the Student Engagement Center so that we can take an act more active role with our students. Um, in doing that, we've, we've surveyed students to find out what they're interested in um, um, 
the student engagement center looking like and then we had a wonderful and still will uh, we've partnered with other departments and had a wonderful take a steady break this week and next and so um we're very excited about um all of the the work that we've been doing with our students as well um next slide so in the future um, we've done a lot with already with the DEI drop box. We've changed that from a suggestion box and made it more of a drop box so students, faculty, and staff can um, help share information, any concerns, questions that they have. We're sponsoring a lunch and learn series. You can see the dates right there. Um, you are welcome to, as I said, um, put it in your syllabus, tell your other, tell other faculty about it. We will have um, anti uh, discussion on anti-fat bias in January, substance use stigma in February, where we're partnering with the um, Family Health Center, um, neurodiversity and learning styles in March, and then working with the deaf and hard of hearing um, community in April. We're also hoping to include um, um, work with the blindness and um, with those who are blind or have low vision. So that's coming up as well. Um, I've been working with WMUX on how to develop a webinar. The, the hope is that we will put it out um, and, and it'll be ready in fall. So keep looking for that. Um, we're, we're excited about these couple of things coming up. Um, DEI listening sessions, so um, CHHS can just talk to us about different issues. Um, a DEI Distinction Award in April. Um, we're thankful that we're going to have a whole year of, of events, calendar of holidays, um, so that we can we can all know what's going on um, and and how to be um, sensitive, interested, compassion. Um, toward those um, those different holidays. And then we're working on a possible newsletter for the DEI office, or maybe we can just make it for CHHS. So, so we got a lot of things coming up and, and we hope that you will, even if you're not sitting on the committee, you will or your faculty will um, want to get involved. I think Betty, do you want to... Betty, do you want to um, um, briefly um, discuss um, the ERASE training that we took as oh, uh, yeah. part of our college um, real quickly and maybe what a next step would be there? Yes, I'm sorry. We forgot to no, put that on good. there. Um, the ERASE training was huge. Um, we, we did that in October. We had um, six hours of um, training for um, on anti-bias, and um, it was opened up to the entire CHH community, as well as the, um, we put it out there to the um, university community as well. And the hope is that after having this training, we can move forward with even more, um, leader, more leadership training. It's our goal that um, the leaders of the college will be the, the ones who start and move us forward in terms of, um, in terms of anti-bias training and implicit bias, we will, of course, be the ones who are leading the charge. We are going to be a, a an inclusive college and one that um, that is concerned about other people. We are the College of Health and Human Services. So if we are concerned about people's health, then we have to be concerned about racism and ageism and sexism. And if we are concerned about the services that we provide to human beings, we've got to care about people and how they're included. And, and so um, we're, we're hoping that you as a community, we as a community, see all of this as valuable work and work that has to be pushed forward. So. Um, Dr. Sissa, make sure that I say what you want to say, but yeah, that's wonderful. And I, and I it's vital to our um, and one of our five um, emphasis and values area moving forward with our strategic plan. So it's critical that we in what we do that we show that we are um, inclusive and value diversity and equity. So thank you, Betty. So our next um, area to look at is our through our Office of Research and uh, Dr. Bridget Weller will lead us through that discussion. Bridget. 
morning, everyone. Um, the Office of Research is continuing to strive to provide opportunities for research and enhance opportunities for research. And we're continuing to focus in three main areas. One is providing learning opportunities for faculty members, also pro providing opportunities to foster collaborations both within the university and in the broader community and streamlining processes. So those continue to be our three main areas of focus. And I'm grateful and honored to re share with you our committee. Uh, they have been just amazing with providing a depth of insight that is both looking at different interdisciplinary issues as well as equity issues and how do we work to ensure we provide access to various resources to support research uh, across the college. So I wanna thank um, the entire committee and I stole their pictures and from last year and added some new pictures this year. So they're on your screen and we have really great representation. I would read their names out, but I'm terrible with names. So please know that's just the only reason. So if anybody has vision issues, I apologize for that. I'm happy to meet with you otherwise. Um, next slide, please. Uh, this semester, we have had a total of 25 hours of professional development. I can actually now say 27.5 because of yesterday, but I did, wanted to get the slides done early. And though, thank all of you who have been participating in the Enhancing Your Research meetings. We've talked about topics from uh, pr proposal submissions to general topics of concerns to revises and resubmits. And we've had 14 participants across five different um, units within the college, and we've had six hours of those trainings. What I want to mention, and one of the things we've really been trying to emphasize is the importance of when you're submitting an external grant to submit a proposal approval form. And that is really critical to jumpstarting the entire process. So if this is new or you're interested, please reach out to me. I'm happy to support you as you walk through that process. The other thing that we've really been focusing on is after you get the award, what to do. And we've got some things in place and we've cleaned up a little bit of those processes. So we'll continue to have enhancing your research meetings around those topics. But if you have any questions, just reach out. We're here for you to support you in that way. We've also had a number of faculty participate in one on one meetings. And that's just wonderful. So thank you. Keep reaching out. I'm loving it. It's great. Um, so far, we've had 16 different um, individuals across the college. Um, uh, roughly 19 hours of one on one since the start of the fall. So please keep reaching out. Um, we're here to support you and your efforts. Go ahead. Thanks. Sorry about that. So I want to highlight some of the resources and supports that we've done. Um, one is we have updated the CHHS research website. Uh, please take a look at it if you'd like. I want to thank everyone for responding to my emails and making sure we are writing things appropriately. And please continue to send me information. Our goal is to update that a couple of times a year to refresh it. One of the things that we were very intentional about was centering it first on what students are doing in terms of their research. And so if you have students who are involved in research, please let us know so that we can showcase that, showcase that on our site. And also doing a nice mix of the various awards and, and grants and funding opportunities that have happened in the college. So if you get an opportunity, take a look, but also please let us know. Um, we're trying our best to keep our eyes on who's doing what, but I don't want anybody to be missed. So if you feel like we've missed what your work is, please, please, please let us know. Um, we're continuing to do the writing hours um, where we meet on Thursdays. Um, there has been a request, so I'll be bumping that up to twice a week next semester. So I'll be sending those invites out to hopefully catch more people. We're roughly around 34 hours of writing cumulative, which is great. I also want to mention that next spring, we are going to be having two writing webinars led by Dr. Sonia Foss and Dr. William Waters. They have presented at WMU before on writing, but they've also led some national initiatives on supporting academic writing. And so they will be providing us with two workshops and those we will also be recording them. So if you can attend, they will be available. The first workshop is gonna be is titled Publishing with Joy and Efficiency. They're gonna talk about how you can align your research and ensure that it's helpful in a way of getting published. They're also gonna discuss finding journals and pitfalls and things to do or pitfalls to look out for to avoid rejection. And so I'm really excited to have them come and do this workshop. And then again, we will record these. So I'm delighted that they have allowed us to do that. The other workshop that they'll be doing is called writing regularly. One of the things that I've consistently heard from faculty is how do we find the time? 
And so they will be doing that um, and focusing on strategies that we can use to support our research in writing um, consistently. Also related to writing, um, a number of you, I believe it's about, we've submitted about five or seven papers, because I've just got two yesterday, um, for the editing services that we're providing through the end of the month. And I'm happy to say that we'll be able to extend that into the spring and be able to send out several more articles to use the editing services. So I will say those of you who've already had the opportunity, I'm gonna allow other individuals to have that opportunity as well, but continue to do use, continue to use those services. They're really um, one of the ones, the ones we've been using is APA formatting and focusing on APA journals. However, if you have another type of style that you need or a preferred editing service, just let us know and we'll work to find what you need there. So I'm happy to share that we um, were able to get a little bit of use the support that was provided by the president and ORI to extend that into the spring term. I also want to share that we still have the e-learning site. Um, so please continue to look there. That's where we've been posting trainings and videos and additional content. Um, I looked at, I can't, I couldn't look at it just for the fall because I couldn't figure out how to cut just for fall. So in total, we've had 61 faculty members or staff across the college visit the site at least 25 times. I'm continuing to use that site as my primary way of pushing announcements about resources out because I figure most of us are probably teaching. We can then get that when we click on there and you can find additional information. And lastly, I'm happy to share that we have started working on the post award administrative support. And we've been working really hard to kind of figure out how to meet those needs. And we've been having some really great conversations with the Office of Research and Innovation, grants and contracts, as well as um, the, our office here about whose roles are what. And we're cleaning those processes up. I will say we still have a way to go. I want to thank Rachel um, Witt for jumping in with both feet and letting me throw a bazillion things at her and uh, meeting with me often to go over Excel spreadsheets. But we're, we're getting there. Um, so please continue to use that resource and please continue to let us know how we can enhance that, improve that to make sure that's meeting your needs. Thank you. Next slide, please. Now I want to say you all have been incredibly productive once again. So if we look at um, the 2021-2022 year, which is how the data are collected kind of around. So I know this doesn't capture the last couple of months, but um, during that 12 month period, there were 73 external grants submitted from individuals on this campus, which I think is huge. And that was from 25 different individuals. And I mean, that's just, I know our teaching load, I know our service load, I know everything else. So for us to be able to do that, that's pretty darn impressive. In that time, we've also been awarded 6.7 million, which to me, I don't know about you. Well, I just think that's a lot of money. So I think that's great. Um, let's keep that up. That's actually up from last year. So um, we're continuing to do a nice little trend up in terms of getting awards. Not only are you get, are we submitting funding and getting funding, we're publishing and disseminating our research in a number of great ways. And so uh, collectively, we've had 68 journal articles, two books, 13 book chapters. 31 presentations and 14 posters. So um, I don't know when we're sleeping, but I'm impressed with every single one of us. Also, you'll see where our, our uh, trend line is for, and our trends are for expenditures, which is great to see that we've been net going up and up over the last few years. I would love to say that this is this past year was the highest of all time, that we love to say that. However, they've been consistently tracking this for about 10 years. And for the last 10 years, we've almost consistently been going up, which I think is wonderful, just showing that we're, we're getting the grant money, we're using the grant money, and we're using it to kind of make a difference and address health issues, health service issues. And the other thing I just want to mention here is we're starting to do a better job of tracking student involvement and how these expenditures will be are used to support students. So it's my hope within the next year, we'll be able to give you a little bit more information because it's not just are we doing research, but it's also are we engaging students in the process? And the new VP of research has really been making that a central focus. So I think, you know, we're continuing to do it um, and the research is getting out there. So just kudos to every single one of you out there making this happen. So thank you, Dr. Weller. Bridget, I want to just um, add that, that um, that 31% increase in five years is is fairly dramatic. Um, I do, like you, want to say that um, the 5,655 or 5,655,286 is our highest ever, but it but we only track a, according uh, apparently 
um, for the past 10 years. So we can say that 5.6 million is the highest on record. So we're gonna verify that we can um, dig, back for, uh, dig back further and verify that we can make a statement. And I think uh, because of that growth over time, it may be the highest on, uh, um, that we've ever had in our college. So the next area we'd like to focus on uh, a bit is our College of Health and Human Services business office, um, including personnel and finances. <laughs> And that is with Marianne Varva. Marianne. Thank you, Dean Sisler, and good morning, everyone. Um, first slide, if we could um, move to the first slide. Thank you. <laughs> um, we want to just acknowledge our newest members of the CHHS family uh, that we have here in this first slide who have joined us uh, this fiscal year. Um, we're extremely happy and we're very pleased that um, they've been with us. And they, they're on board as we continue to uh, work with students, um, provide instruction, support our students um, and the needs that, that uh, they have. So um, thank you all and welcome. Um, wanted to talk a little bit about the strategic resource management um, as well. Just a little update to reiterate what Dean Sisser had just shared in earlier slides um, that we are as a college continued, you know, we are positioned well generating uh, 4.12 million more in revenue, which is wonderful. Um, and as the subvention return model continues to be adjusted, we do anticipate a one time return of about $280,000 for this fiscal year, 22 uh, 23. Um, and we do continue to work with college council leadership to better fine tune plans for this year and also work with uh, chairs and directors and administrative um, staff to review unit accounting in greater detail. Um, and also, the, yes, there will be shifts in the model as the university and CHHS um, continues to adjust to the new approach. Uh, so there will be more to come, but thank you very much for your continued patience as we work through this process. Um, let's go ahead and move to the next slide. Marianne, I'm going to um, add a little bit here um, that I'd like to emphasize that it's going to be very important in what we do and how we use any uh, dollars that are coming back to our college. We have a lot of things that we need for accreditation, for our units, for our support services and so on. But I'd like to make sure that we use it judiciously and we use it for really a return on that investment. And not only for us as a college um, and finding new ways to support our students and pathways for our students, but for the university. We're just not going to take these dollars and just um, like um, use it in a way that may not um, look um, be used for sustainability and actually growth for the college and university. So I'm going to be relying on our leaders and our faculty and staff um, for opportunities, almost in an RFP way, where we have requests for proposals on how the dollars can be used to to support our vision to, um, of, of our career pathways, to support our objectives when it comes to the strategic plan, to support each other in an interdisciplinary way, and to make sure that we support the university. So I just wanted to take that opportunity. And, and I think that's exciting because it's really making sure that the dollars that we have, we use them prudently, judiciously, and for growth, sustainability, and um, for investments. So thanks. So Absolutely. You know, this is the detail, right, Marianne? Yes, this is the, the detail, the grand detail for this year. Uh, it just shows a breakdown of our general fund budget uh, with the flow of revenue that CHHS generates and the expenses that are made for the year. Uh, total revenue, if you look in the bolds, uh, amounts to 47.9, almost 48 million dollars and our expenses, which include compensation and fringe dollars, uh, F&A expenses, course fees, GA, DA uh, expenses, uh, total about 20.7 million. Uh, if you deduct the university participation assessment tax, uh, 20.6 million and our college's uh, space costs, 
we are left with 4.12 million, uh, which will then go towards the strategic allocation to other colleges and will be used to make colleges and auxiliaries um, whole that are operating in net expense. Okay. Thank you, Marianne. Appreciate it. So our next area that we want to focus on is our student uh, services, advising, enrollment, recruitment, retention. And I'm going to pass it over to uh, Nancy Kretzinger. Nancy? Good morning. Thank you. Good morning. So I'm happy to say uh, that our freshman incoming class was up slightly this year for the second consecutive year. <laughs> Uh, retention continues to be our greater challenge, especially at the junior and senior levels. So we are um, focusing working with student success on main campus to be sure we're in sync with efforts there, contacting students who uh, we've not heard from in a while, where we receive student concern forms, students who are not registering uh, as registration opens, and just generally reaching out to be available to students. Uh, that's all for a variety of reasons, right? So financial seem continues to be a struggle for students. And sometimes the reality really hits in the junior and senior year that um, they're running out of money and some panic and leave. So we're trying to get out in front of that and uh, give better information about the financial cost and how it can be financed earlier on. Sense of belonging, um, mental health and well-being, and of course, academic challenges. So our, our primary focus needs to be on our students. It's why we're here. It's why we do what we do and how can we best support them. So a new concern as we move into the next slide, you're going to see some data on enrollment. And a new concern here is uh, we're dropping off for the first time at our graduate levels. So the big thing to understand about enrollment in this slide, as we look at the top, in 2005, we were 6.4% of the total university's headcount. And then 5.5% of the university's student credit hours. By 2019, we had increased to be over 13.3 or 13.4% of the university's total enrollment and total student credit hours. That's a very critical point in the SRM model because we don't receive the actual dollar to dollar that we generate. The university calculates the percentage each college generates in headcount and in student credit hours. And then they apply those same percentages to the total tuition collected and the total state appropriation fee. So it's a very critical connection that is if we lose our position within the college, of the portion that we generate, we're going to go down in revenue. So that's something we're paying a lot of attention to right now. Um, so for this year, we are down at the undergraduate and the graduate level in the fall semester. And fall semester is when the official data is reported to the IPEDS um, agency and how the national uh, data bank is collected. But for spring, I'm happy to say at this point, getting ready for spring, and we still have about three, four weeks of registration, then um, we're starting to stabilize and we're going up a little more in terms of our share of the headcount and credit hours. I'm ready for the next slide, please, Dean Sisler. So in recruiting, we welcomed Susan Pendleton as our new manager of recruitment and outreach. We're holding steady at this point in the recruitment cycle for fall. We're down a little bit in total applications, but we're up in total admissions. So now our focus as a college will be on yielding at a very high rate those who are admitted. So we'll continue to have some open house events through spring for high school juniors and seniors who may not yet have made application or decisions. 
But then we're also um, converting what used to be known as admitted student events will now be future Bronco days. And it's a more intensive interactive experience. So we're working with our great recruiting committee um, to develop a, a combination uh, uh, treasure hunt, scavenger hunt, uh, combined with case studies for those who come to visit us and they'll, they'll move throughout the college. We're doing three WMU events this year to you uh, in Detroit, Grand Rapids and Chicago, and there will be about uh, tentatively 80 of us who will travel to those three areas for major evening events. And then we'll be doing the National College Fair in Detroit later in the spring. Our community college partnerships. So I'm not going to start naming names because I'm afraid I'll forget someone, but we have rocked the community college partnerships with admissions. Um, we are by far the most engaged college at this point. And um, we have all of our undergraduate programs, including speech language, where we don't really have speech language connections that work, but we've been looking at what we can do with sign language. And I appreciate the speech language uh, department being open to considering what we can do, even though it might not be quite as obvious as some of the other programs. So thank you to all who've brought so much success to that work. Our advisors moved to the Student Engagement Center on the first floor, and they're excited about the opportunities of um, a greater impact in students partnering with DEI and recruitment initiatives. They've engaged in 1,299 appointments with students this semester, offered in a variety of options via in-person video and phone, as well as email communications with students. I'm very happy to, um, it's not the first announcement to, uh, but to highlight that Melinda Lockett is now our Director of Academic Advising. And uh, just new this week, Mandy Cox uh, is now Advisor Senior for Retention. And Jill Hamilton is Advisor Senior for Articulation Agreements. And we also this fall welcomed Lucy Kent Bracken as uh, one of our new advisors. And she's primarily focused on pre-nursing but already working toward how can she help us in other ways. And then on Monday, Core Houndshell. So that's just solidified in the last couple of days. And on Monday, the 12th, Core Houndshell will join us as an administrative assistant for students in the Student Engagement Center. Uh, functionally centralized advising began on July 1. So Melinda duly reports to the college and to Dr. Tamika Ward, who is Assistant Dean for Academic Advising for the University. And that was all done so that we can create a more cohesive approach. I'm ready for the next slide, please, Dean Sisler. So as we look forward for student services, um, we're focused on a more seamless approach, working with our DEI committee and learning how we can yield and retain a more diverse student body creating an invading, inviting, engaging space for the students on the first floor. So certainly the Student Engagement Center is a big piece of that, but we also, the space previously known as the LRC is now known as the Study Hub, and it's dedicated space for students to study in groups or individually, individually and um, testing needs, both accommodations testing and mass testing. And the Student Leadership Council, uh, they have been great to work with this semester. Thank you all for the nominations you made for that council. This is the most engaged group of students on the council we've had in probably seven years. So they have just been great. And they're working with us to um, continue to identify good ways to support students' sense of belonging. Thank you so much, Nancy. I really appreciate it. Uh, there's a lot going on in student services and and I love that we're engaging the students along the way. It's just phenomenal. They are a great, great, great group. So our next area focuses on information technology, um, both technology services and tech center and Joshua, you know, Joshua, do you want to take us through the slide? Yes, thanks. Uh, Dean Sussler. Um, 
I don't have um, any major announcements to make about IT in general. There are some things sort of bubbling up in the background related to campus wide IT activities. Um, it's still a little too early in the game to make any announcements about those, so I don't want to. I don't really want to reveal anything right now because things are a little too uh, little too early in the game. So I would rather uh, we discuss some other things today, um, specifically our tech center. Um, primarily the tech center survey that many people um, uh, took recently. Um, this is um, the about the tech center initiative that Nathan and I proposed to run early this semester, and we've been working on with a team of CHHS tech folks since then. Um, we introduced the concept to most folks in faculty meetings recently, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time discussing the overall concept uh, or the goals, but Many of you participated in that survey that our team sent out recently regarding the use of innovative technology in the college. <clears throat> our largest outcome from the survey, many folks are interested in the technologies mentioned in the survey and responded that they would use those technologies if they had either training or an introduction to those technologies. So in response, the tech center team would like to experimentally, remembering you know, that sometimes experiments fail, um, schedule some hands-on introductions to the technologies that were mentioned in the survey. We have some folks in the college who are already well-versed in some of these technologies, and if anyone would like to volunteer to run a short workshop, uh, hint, hint, demonstrating how the technology is being used in their instruction, research, or clinical applications, um, please let me or Nathan know, and we can discuss a uh, schedule with you. Uh, yep, if you could stay there. Thanks, uh, Dean. Yeah. Um, let's see where I am. Uh, this is a great way for you and your department to invest in the tech center without spending any money. Um, so if you remember our presentation, the invest slide came up when we discussed things and uh, we mentioned that you don't have to spend any money to invest and help us about our tech center. Um, another thing to remember um, when we do workshops, uh, workshops don't work uh, if nobody participates. Um, also, uh, for the tech center coming soon, um, one thing we're working on is a virtual location online, not virtual meaning virtual reality, but virtual location online where uh, CHHS folks will be able to meet up, inquire about, discuss uh, technology that they might want to use or are using uh, in their instruction, research, or clinical applications. It's envisioned sort of like a community space um, with a lobby of sorts where one might post an inquiry about a problem or a technology they wish to use, be directed to uh, either a champion, uh, which is what we're considering like an expert with that technology, um, or perhaps begin a general conversation about their idea and maybe brainstorm solutions. This is an experimental idea also. Um, and success will depend on engagement with the people involved. Um, when this becomes available to the community, your tech center team will make an announcement and post links to provide easy access. Um, another coming soon uh, with your help, the tech team in concert with the Student Engagement Center would like to promote your use of cutting edge and innovative technology. Uh, one of the first steps in this process will be a presence in the Student Engagement Center on the two new media carts that are complete. When they're not being used for other programming, uh, which will be their primary use, I think, these carts can be used uh, to play media, highlighting your innovative use of technology. So we're gonna need your help to collect and create media content for that purpose. That media could be the form of video, um, photos, uh, composite images, I'm thinking like research poster files, PDFs that you've created, um, slide shows uh, that could be animated slideshows, slide decks like PowerPoints, things like that. Uh, we encourage all departments to submit media that includes examples of technology work being done. Um, I'm going to have you go ahead and flip to the next slide if you could, Dean Sisley. Thank you. Um, if you have your cell phones handy, now is a good time to grab those. Um, the link shown on the previous um, slide is a Microsoft form, and this QR code will also take you there, and the link is below as well. Um, this Microsoft form will allow for the upload of media that we can review in the, in the Tech Center group. 
um, and possibly utilized for this purpose. Um, this is a login protected link, so it's um, campus members only. Um, and, the, and this QR code um, is available on the technology page of the CHHS website actually right now. Oh, thanks, Nathan, for three through the link in the chat. Um, if you also can, uh, you also can go to the um, technology page on the CHHS website, um, part of the Health and Human Services site. Um, so if you navigate to um, the CHHS website and the technology page therein, um, we have that link. Joel also ready at the helm. Um, so you will find that link available there as well. But if you have media on your phone, um, this QR code is a, a great way to get there uh, also um, and submit that video or media that you may have. Um, if you have questions about this, we'll be taking questions at the end of the presentation today, um, or you can throw those in the chat or also contact us anytime. I want to That's thank all. you, Joshua. I want to thank you and Nathan for moving us in this area because um, we have um, virtual reality, augmented virtual reality. We have we have measurement devices that are kind of real time that, and and of course, sim spaces that we need. If we put it in our engagement center as illustrations when students and or in our labs when students are around. Um, that's where students live um, and in, in our new age of technology. And, and I'm sure um, most of that will assist us in our instruction, but, and, and our research and also ways for learning for our students. So really appreciate when you and Nathan came to me um, about this. I almost jumped out of my seat, as you know. So um, it's a wonderful um, area that we need to cultivate and show and, and capture the imaginations of our students. So thank you so much. So now we're gonna go into some of our community connected programs. Of course, we have the Center for Disability Services and then the Unified Clinic. So um, leading us through the CDS um, um, updates is uh, Dr. Andrea Perez. Andrea, if you wanna take it um, forward. <clears throat> Absolutely, good morning, everybody. Um, can you all hear me? I just wanna make sure. Yes. Yes, wonderful. I was having a little bit of uh, struggles yesterday with it. So, um, my hope is to offer you all um, a summary of how CDS or the Center for Disability uh, Services closed out the year. Um, financially, uh, CDS suffered a significant loss to our reserves during the pandemic. Um, but since we have been able to slowly rebuild all of our services, um, and for the first time since uh, 2022, uh, we have actually closed the year with higher revenue than expenses. Um, and this has uh, significantly allowed us to start to rebuild uh, many of our reserves and to look towards investing in many of our current programs. Um, we employ a number of student employees and continue to favor uh, providing opportunities to students within our college, uh, given the interest in health services. Um, overall, we paid just under $600,000 in student wages this year. Um, I'm very happy to share also that during uh, here, we've been able to raise the student wages by 30%. Um, and this has been in collaboration with, um, you know, uh, the, a lot of our funding sources and, and making sure that the wages that our students are getting uh, are comparable to uh, similar community positions. And uh, we're continuing to advocate just for a uh, slight more uh, in their increase, uh, but that is uh, still to be determined. Um, we hosted about 105 students from various disciplines. Um, and, and we have that, uh, that list that we have music therapy students, occupational therapy students, speech and language pathology, physical therapy, nursing, psychology. Uh, we have IHA interns. Uh, and I'm sure I'm missing some, but uh, they they have offered incredible opportunities for our participants, and we're hopeful that this also offers opportunities for your students within the college and, and an opportunity to work directly with our populations. We're always open and looking for more collaboration opportunities. And so if if after this presentation or or if later on you'd like to um, even start a conversation with me on what we could possibly collaborate on, Please, please reach out to me and I'm happy to put my information on, on the chat. 
um, but we're always looking for, for more opportunities for our participants of the program, but also for your students. Um, let's see, we have two center-based programs, the skill building program. This is the one that's located right on the EWB campus, uh, the first floor. Uh, we have seen an increase in participation. I'm not sure if, if you're all aware, but we were, we were forced to shut down during the, the pandemic years and we slowly rebuild. We went from, you know, 18 participants that returned to 30 participants that returned. And right now we're serving just under, um, I believe it's 86 clients that we're serving at the skill building program today. Um, and we have a wait list of about 20, 25 folks that want to start their program. And so there's a vast amount of opportunities for, um, for collaboration, uh, innovative services, and um, certainly a, a, a way to serve our community. Um, we have our senior day program. This is the one that's located on Cork Street. Um, and again, we, we've seen an increase in partnerships uh, with you all and, and an increase in attendance and enrollment with our senior population. Uh, we have three community-based programs. So they're not center-based, they're community-based programs. We offer senior in-home and com community support to so go into the seniors' homes, and we've seen an increase in attendance there. Um, we also now, in February of this past year, we increased this service. We uh, have now um, created a program to offer in-home and community services, so one-to-one -one services to adults with intellectual and developmental disability. Um, this has been a great need identified by our local community mental health and, and one that has been lacking uh, in terms of availability of providers, and so we were very um, proud to take this effort on, and um, we've seen an increase in the amount of uh, folks we're able to serve here. Um, and then we have our case management services that continue. We we just recently hired a uh, new case manager, and we're serving eight folks within the community. Um, overall, during the year, we served 250 individuals, um, and I anticipate that this number is just going to continue to get higher and higher. Um, and I'm happy to report that the satisfaction with our program uh, remains high. And so, um, again, this is just a, a snapshot of uh, where we've ended the year. Um, always looking for opportunities to partner, to do research, to collaborate. So um, if any ideas come to mind, please, please reach out to me. Thank you, Dr. Perez. And I just wanna comment that um, Dr. Perez is working with some other um, community organizations that do similar work and she is an avid negotiator for her clients. She's been able with others to bring up the reimbursements for the services that we provide to the level that is needed and sustainable for programs. She has been an amazing advocate for people um, who need these um, services across our community. I can't thank you em enough for that. And we should all be aware of the uh, amazing work she does. Um, so next we have Unified Clinics. And Joe, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you, <laughs> we have about 15 minutes. We have, they do so much at Unified. I don't wanna shortchange anything, but Joe, if you could kind of give five minutes um, with your slides on an overview in the slides, there's so much going on, um, but I wanna, um, I want you to, to balance the, the amount of information with um, the, the top of uh, level things that people need to know. Thank you, Joe. I, I will. Uh, thanks, Dean Sisler. I, I asked uh, someone to put some information together and gave them some data, and then I got seven slides as opposed to the two I asked for. So I apologize for this. So I'm going to be coming at you very fast with this. Um, we're a busy place over here at the Unified Clinic, so I broke it down in terms of of uh, the different clinics. And so the numbers, I, I'll just round them up for you real quick. Um, one thing I would just say is that at, through the coming out of the pandemic, we, we have kind of come out as a different organization than we went in because uh, telehealth and uh, uh, virtual services became a possibility in many of our clinics that they wasn't before. So as we come out, we'll be doing <laughs> You know, more virtual, but also telehealth and hybrid types of things. So, starting out with behavioral health services and psychology, there's some numbers there. Obviously, both, you know, we're providing 
virtual services, telehealth services, and face-to-face -face services, but 8,000 hours in, in behavioral health services, which is really a substance use disorder and mental health clinic. And then we have 67 clients that are receiving services in psychology. So that's a very busy clinic and we continue to uh, work with different types of funding sources. Um, the Children's Trauma Assessment Center, they maintain services face-to-face -face throughout the pandemic. And I think it's important to point that out. Um, uh, CTAC has been a, a kind of the gold standard for assessment services uh, nationally, and they work in Colorado, they work here in Michigan, they just opened up a new clinic in uh, Cadillac, Northern Michigan, has been very well received. And you see some numbers there in terms of the numbers of children that they've assessed and the family drug court involvement and the BRISA, which is building resiliency in families that are experiencing substance use disorder, which was kind of a new program a couple of years ago that was grant funded. So that's a very busy clinic as well. Next slide, please. Um, I, I'll spend just a moment on this. Uh, we, we've, we've given a home to our uh, pet assisted or animal assisted therapy clinic. Um, Dr. Angie Mo has, uh, has an office in our, in our building now, and uh, uh, you're looking at Sunny and Poppy and Oreo. Their pictures, uh, they have been extremely well received. And I wish I had a video of Senator Stabenow that visited our office back in August. Uh, Basically, the visit was over once she saw Oreo, and uh, it, you know she followed. You know she wanted to know where the dog was the entire time she was in our clinic. But, but pet assisted therapy, just from a serious point of view, I just it really has had a, a huge impact. It's amazing the 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 response that particularly the kids in the trauma assessment center uh, as they come in the door and these dogs and some of a couple of them are massive dogs. Uh, they're just standing next to the kids and the kids, these dysregulated, emotionally dysregulated kids just change and go back to a child again. It's just amazing. So next slide, please. Um, uh, the uh, Charles Van Riper Hearing Clinic, once again, very, very busy, well accepted uh, program, does phenomenal work. Um, and you can see 856 clients that are served here. Uh, we're we're working with this program to try to make sure that that all of the funding that we should be able to be getting reimbursed for, uh, we're getting. Uh, that's that's a challenge. Uh, a lot of these folks are um, their their incomes are very low, and we work really hard to make sure that that's supported. Next slide, please. Uh, Vision Clinic. Um, I, all of you who get glasses that are in this uh, meeting, please come and get your glasses at the Vision Clinic. Okay, that's my my advertisement for that. But uh, blindness and remote vision uh, continue to provide services, and we're hoping as we move forward to actually maybe get more students involved in that clinic. Okay, next slide, please. Um, and speech and language uh, here again. This is a this is a program that comes in. Uh, they are here uh, getting services. Uh, it's unbelievable the response that people have. Particularly, I would just speak right now. Aphasia seems to be a, you know, it's in the news and whatnot with Bruce Willis suffering from aphasia. Um, and we're seeing a lot of interest in that service and we want to continue to support that. Next slide. Okay. Um, and so we also have women's comprehensive health uh, here and we're seeing an increase. The Dr. Sharon comes in daily and tells me that she's getting more and more referrals. So we're seeing that that's being a, a service that's being uh, utilized quite significantly. OT services, once again, uh, being developed and uh, well used. A lot of students are coming through that program. And uh, that's the other part of it. We do have a fair number of interns through the speech program and the occupational therapy program. We see interns in the BHS program through psychology, through uh, uh, C, um, CECP, you know, uh, interdisciplinary health, as well as the PA program. And then music therapy has kind of been a little bit less this year, but is building as we go. Next slide. Thank you so much, Joe. I think that's it. That's um, it. So I appreciate you summarizing in <laughs> fashion. Great job. Thanks. Uh, so we have we have a lot to look forward to. I'm not going to go into depth, but I do want to, um, you know, just in some of the areas we're going to continue to develop, the strategic plan is going to be key. Um, I do want to emphasize, though, that we are interviewing this week or did interview two candidates for the development officer that we will be um, receiving and hopefully we'll land one of the two people who interviewed this week, both the College of Engineering and Applied Sciences and us are now up for investments from advancement for a development officer. And we had two great candidates. Hopefully one of them will agree to come um, uh, 
to work with us. So that's going to be tremendous as we look for other sources of income for our college, but more importantly for the programs, both the ones that are community oriented, as well as the ones in research and in other areas that that need philanthropic dollars to support what they do. That's hugely exciting. And as you may know, we've never had that investment in our college before. Over time, we're gonna take on some of that cost, but no more than 50% of that individual's salary. So at first, the advancement is providing the full um, FTE for us to cultivate that partnership with, with people, with someone who will cultivate partnerships for you. So the last uh, slide I wanna share is that we are um, this close to um, finish with our 2022 uh, community or impact report from the College of Health and Human Services. We have a couple of entries that we need from actually some students to, to round out to get some quotes. And of course, they're very busy um, doing what they do, that is studying. Um, so we should have that next week or the, or, or the following week and we'll send out reminders um, and the, the link to that impact report. If you go to this one, this um, link right now, you'll get our um, prior ones, but we will have the 2022 available soon. It's amazing. It kind of summarizes all the work that we're, we've done over the past year. So we have seven minutes in all of this. We lost five at the beginning. We lost seven at the beginning, I think. So any questions, comments, discussion? I know it's not a lot of time. And these can be questions or comments, discussion on any of the areas that we talked about today. Good morning. Uh, this is Marianne Triplett. Can you hear me? Yes, Marianne. How are you, yes. Marianne? Yes. I'm doing well. Um, I, I just want to say congratulations on um, what sounds like to be great work happening with your student engagement center um, and the hub. And uh, as always, I'm going to ask, um, um, is there a timeline or plans to kind of expand um, those types of supports for our graduate students, uh, especially because so many of them are not necessarily Kalamazoo centric? Um, yes, Marion, that, that's a really good. Um, so there are some efforts uh, moving forward um, in GR and we're trying to do a little bit better and we're trying to do it collectively with the other programs in GR. I know you are in Benton Harbor and I know we've been trying to connect um, mostly through you um, into Benton Harbor um, and the graduate programs. Yes, we 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 think that the Student Services Center is not just for undergrad, and it is for our graduate students as well. There are places more and more. We're trying to find spaces and places within the building. It's going to be a little bit more challenging. We're trying to get some administrative support over in GR. Um, and I don't know if anybody else wants to add to that. I, I know. I'm so sure. say, yeah, go ahead. I'll be glad to say just quickly, Mary and I'd be happy to talk with you about specific ideas of how we can better support students remotely. And um, so I'll be in touch with you via email to see what we can figure out. And those are great action items for the learner focused. <laughs> Great. Values working group too, just to put a plug in. So thank you. We need to capture those ideas and concerns, Marion. So thank you. And the DEI office is certainly interested in that. We have only once um, our graduate assistant is housed in GR and and is um, working with folks up there to do some things. But we would love to know how we could get more involved with the Benton Harbor location as well. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. And I just want to emphasize while I am in Benton Harbor um, and uh, talking about those students doing field, doing the internships, you know, we have students upward of Muskegon and upward in the upper peninsula, as well as going uh, to Lansing and then over in the east side of the state in terms of our, our graduate program. So I'm thinking about holistically, but I thank you for uh, those responses and, and we'll be in contact. Thank you, Marion. Hi, Dean, Dean Sisler. This is Chandice Covington from Nursing. Yes, you mentioned, you. Good morning. You mentioned in your report quality indicators early in your report. 
where can we review what those quality indicators are? Sure, I can. I have a list of them that we proposed. Um, um, our chairs, directors, um, and I put some of those together, including our uh, student services. Um, I put those together in a list um, for the academic affairs for consideration. And then other units did as well, other colleges did as well. So I can share that um, list. It was a draft, and if there's any input, um, we can change, still have time to change some of those. Thank you so much. Absolutely. I'm there's writing a, a note a right now. There's a question in the chat. Yes. If that person would like to just say it. I was wondering why there was why no there? report from the IP steering committee. Here. I think IP is an important component of the college and a lot of good work is being done, um, yet the work is not highlighted and not emphasized at the college. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Mayorara, is, that was you, correct? I, I couldn't yes. see. Yes, yes. Um, it, um, why? Um, 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 that's a really good question. And what um, what I've been thinking a lot about is more formal reporting from some of our committees. We kind of focused on our offices uh, today. Um, as a as a, a regular scheduled formal report of our two major areas, which are um, um, IPE, the IP uh, committee, as well as the global engagement committee. Very well taken. There's a lot of great work that was done, and um, I will take note of that and make sure we include that in our next um, meeting. Thank and just a, a just a suggestion too. Anything you want to share to the college as a whole, please send to Ron and Joel so that we can start getting those announcements out in the in the weekly just kind of news updates. It really is kind of an informal way for all of us to share the work that we're doing and that our students and colleagues are doing. So please, yeah, please take a, a couple minutes and do that when there's something you wanna share. And yeah, we'll do both that um, more informal kind of when events happen way on a weekly basis. And then um, yes, we definitely, have a way for those two committees to report out in our college meeting in the future. Thank you. And I just dropped uh, in the chat as well to piggyback on what Carla just said. The the um, the marketing support request form is is um, a good place to drop any information that you want shared with the college. We can do that in those emails. We can do that. Uh, on social media, on the website, in any number of ways. So um, just to to keep that on your radar as well. Thank you. And we have about one more minute. Um, I, I have received a lot of great feedback on the, the weekly updates for our college. We'll, we'll continue, we meet the week before to discuss what we need to put in each of those um, upcoming uh, college updates and please, yeah, let us know and we will add um, announcements as you need and updates. Well, thank you everyone. It's, oh, is there one other? No, I'm hearing none. Um, it's 10 a.m. Thank you very much. I, I hope that was helpful and insightful and I wish you the best of the rest of the semester. Appreciate everyone. Thanks.